fellow nature enthusiasts. My name is Anna Valdez, and I am an intern for the Natural Resource Partnership team for the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. I am so excited you could join us today. We are doing a series of interviews with experts to tell us how people can find biodiversity close to home. This could be either in your house, your backyard, on your block, or in a nearby park. Collecting information about biodiversity to better understand the types and numbers of species that live around us is fun, enriching, and can contribute to science. To learn more about how to capture and share biodiversity data, we have a video about how to use apps and how to participate. Today, we have the amazing opportunity to talk to an expert in the field of rodent community ecology, Dr. Lauren Nolfel Clement, or Dr. No. Dr. No works for Suffolk State University as an associate professor and chair of the biology department. Thank you, Dr. No, for joining us today. We're so excited to be able to talk to you and share some of your knowledge. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Anna. Can you briefly tell us a little bit about who you are and share some information about the field you're an expert in? So I am uh, Dr. Lauren Nolfo Clemens. I'm uh, chair of the biology department at Suffolk University. And my specialty, as Anna said, is rodent community ecology. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why rodents live where they live, um, what habitats they choose to live in, and how they interact with other rodent species in the environment. That sounds so interesting. I can't wait to learn more. So what got you interested about learning more about rodent communities? Um, it's, a, it's actually, I think it's an interesting story. When I started out as an undergraduate doing independent research, my primary investigator, my mentor, he actually studied rattlesnakes and I was charged with doing some radio tracking of rattlesnakes, but rattlesnakes eat rodents and he put me on a little side project with a graduate student who was tagging the rodents so they would be marked so if the snakes ate them and you scanned them you could see what rodent they had eaten and where they had been located based upon where you had tagged the rodent. And I like that part much more than I enjoyed radio tracking <laughs> rattlesnakes and that really gave me the rodent bug. I was amazed at how fierce they are. Um, considering that so many different species eat them, they, they have this kind of can-do, never-give-up attitude, and they also are pretty social, as most people realize, at, at some level, as they interact with things like rats and squirrels, whether they want to or not. <laughs> so when you're talking about how uh, go-getter they are, um, what type of habitats do rodent communities typically prefer? Well, that's what's interesting. Rodents are very they're very adaptable. I mean, partially it is a function of their fast generation time. They're short-lived, they reproduce in high numbers. So as a whole, this, most rodent species are extremely adaptable because generation by generation, they can adapt to different conditions as they change. So they do well both in pretty undisturbed habitats, forests, they do well in you know farmlands, suburbia. We've all had our share of rodent encounters. Most people might not describe them as being pleasant. They can be found in our houses, not even know that they're there. People have all sorts of rodents living in their attics, whether it be squirrels, flying squirrels, perhaps even rats. Most people have a mouse in their house at some point, but if there is food and there's a warm place and there's bedding, you're sure to find a rodent there. So what kind of species will people most likely find in the Boston area? Well, we do have our share of rodents. I mean, most people do know uh, at least tourists, when you go to the Boston Public Garden, there are a uh, number of squirrels there. So there are squirrels in our parks. They also do live in the attics of some of the buildings. Occasionally, you'll see one running across a busy street. And I know I look around to see, is there a tree anywhere around here? But it could be they're living in uh, the attic of a, of a home or some uh, building somewhere. Obviously, people will also see um, Norway rats. Those are a pretty common species. They tend to live in subterranean burrows, so if you're wandering around, especially around uh, Faneuil Hall, um, what you will see is sometimes holes in the ground, and if you stand on the lump where the holes are, it'll feel kind of hollow. That is the entrance to a rat's nest, um, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, also, you may see mice. There are mice, both house mice and white-footed mice, which are a native species that are found in the city itself, and then, of course, on the, on the Harbor Islands, where I do the majority of my research. So are there any helpful tools we can use to try and find these species in and around our homes and backyards and parks? Well, I gave you the, the hint about the rats. Um, <laughs> if you see a rat out during the day, it means that the population has a, a very high density. 
rats prefer not to be seen during the day. They usually move around at night, but you can see the entrance of their burrows if you know where to look. Usually they're kind of underneath um, a bush, at the base of a tree, a shrub, something like that. Usually the entrance is clear of debris, but it can be seen if you know where to look. Squirrels, if there's big trees, especially oak trees, you may see squirrels around. The only island where we really see squirrels in the Boston Harbor is Thompson Island. It has a lot of oak trees, so that's one of the reasons why I think the squirrels are still um, found there. The thing about rodents and most mammals is besides the squirrels, most of the time, what you're not, you're not necessarily going to see the animal, you're going to see some sign of the animal, whether it be mm -hmm. set, um, meaning droppings of some sort, uh, some sort of perhaps, sometimes you'll find pieces of skeletons, things like that. Rats do also have a particular smell, that whole I smell a rat thing is actually based upon, upon truth. Um, but especially with mice, usually it's the droppings that kind of that kind of give them away. The little tiny, smaller than a, a grain of, of sand, kind of you know, black dehydrated droppings. They they really rodents generally don't go to the bathroom in one spot. So wherever they go, there will be droppings. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone is starting to get really interested about uh, learning more about rodents, where can they find more information? Well, generally. Um, there's, you know, lots of online resources. Believe it or not, exterminators have a tremendous amount of information on both rodents and many species of insects. And it's, and it's accurate for the most part. There's also the Animal Diversity Web, which is a website out of the University of Michigan that's maintained by uh, professors. Students do write the articles, but then they're checked by experts. Um, generally, if you're interested in looking at mammal sign, not just rodents, if you're looking for things like tracks, um, the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Game has a really good, it's, uh, it's online too, a little pamphlet of wildlife tracks for wildlife identification. So that's also helpful. I actually use that um, after a snowfall if I find a track that maybe is not super clear, but I'm trying to figure out what it might be if it's something unusual, I actually will refer to that because it gives size and also kind of shape of the, of the tracks. Perfect. So when people come across tracks or droppings, what is the best way to capture a picture uh, when collecting observations for iNaturalist or other biodiversity tools? Well, first and foremost, you need scale. This is one of the, the biggest mistakes that people make. They take pictures of all sorts of things, um, especially animals and their sign without having some sort of scale. So the best kind of things you can use for scale are common items that people you know, know in their head about how big it is. So something like a pen or a pencil, a quarter is a really good one, any sort of spare change because you know, there's a mental image, you know how big that thing is. So when you put it next to the, the sign, it's, it's pretty obvious how, how big it is. I do carry a Swiss Army knife for this purpose. <laughs> it's really good for things like tracks, um, putting it next to them, because you can get an idea of how big the track is, but also kind of the distance between them. Um, that's another thing. If you're looking at tracks, it's not just the track itself. It's also the pattern of how the animal was walking. So um, this is especially useful in either mud or snow. If you could take a picture of the, one of the tracks up close, but then kind of back up and get the track pattern if it's available, that's also helpful in identification. Perfect. So why is it so important for us to be looking at rodent communities and documenting them? Well, <laughs> generally rodents will go with humans no matter where we go. Um, they can be considered um, pests, they do, you know, since the dawn of agriculture, we have tried to <laughs> deter rodents because they eat the same sorts of things we eat. So there's, there's that aspect to it. Um, there's also in this area, unfortunately, Lyme disease. So when you have large numbers of rodents and deer, deer must also be present. They could also be um, carriers and reservoirs uh, for Lyme disease. But on the positive end, there's lots of things that eat rodents. Raptors will eat rodents, um, kind of meso predators, things like foxes, um, coyotes, occasionally a raccoon if they can catch one if they're really motivated that day. So they do form um, snakes. They do form the base of kind of many food chains as well. So when you have a healthy ecosystem, you do have to have rodents present so the larger organisms have something to eat. That makes sense. So are there concerns you have uh, about these species and climate change? Well, generally rodents are pretty adaptable, as I've said. Mm -hmm. You may see shifts in communities over time, but the species that you commonly find in the Boston area, it may not be 
as big of an issue. But species like snowshoe hare, which you do find in certain parts of Massachusetts, may start shifting their ranges further north because they are cold adapted. Um, I'm sorry, snowshoe hares are lagomorphs, but I kind of cluster them <laughs> with rodents, so I guess you can um, cut that out. But um, most species of rodents, like I said, they do tend to be adaptable, so climate change will not affect them much. If we do see increases in um, water levels due to increased precipitation, things like that, we may see shifts in actually where beavers are found, because the more water you have, the more beavers you'll have. Those are um, really big rodents. But as far as temperature changes, at least for the species that we have here, it probably won't have much of an, much of an impact on them. Nice. So are there concerns you have for the safety of the species or for the people observing them when they're photogra uh, photographing them? For the squirrels, definitely. I see so many people, you know, you see a squirrel around, you're like, oh, obviously all wildlife wants me to hand feed it. So people are always, you know, trying to hand feed um, squirrels. Sometimes they'll offer them things that are in the environment, anyway, like trying to hand them a pine cone or something just to get the squirrel to come closer. That is dangerous. Although rodents don't usually carry rabies in uh, really high percentages, there is a chance that you could catch something as deadly as rabies from a rodent if it bites you and breaks the skin. You don't want to possibly expose yourself to something like that. They can also scratch you, injure you in other ways. You could get an infection. I know that um, one of my neighbors once got into an encounter with a, a woodchuck. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, they are also large rodents, so also known as groundhogs and he was bitten by it, and he had to get a rabies vaccine because actually groundhogs carry rabies at a much higher rate than most other rodents. And rodents have large, very sharp teeth because they're gnawing animals. So if you get bitten by them, it's, it's gonna break the skin and it's gonna hurt more than you probably expect. Even something relatively small like a rat can definitely break the skin. Um, even a mouse, if you're not wearing any gloves, can break the skin. So just be wary of handling rodents um, even something like a chipmunk, always wear some sort of hand protection, some sort of glove protection if you have to handle them for some, some reason. Um, but generally, there's no good reason to be, to be handling any sort of wildlife. Um, I have had chipmunks get into my house through the dog door, I'm going to admit, and I put a live trap out and then move them outside. Even I, who handle rodents all the time, try my best never to have to handle them under normal conditions. That makes sense and it's very good to be safety first. Um, so is there a common species that brings you delight that can be found on the Boston Harbor Islands? Um, well, there's the white-footed mice, which I, which I study. I think they're the, the cutest of mice. They don't look like a house mice. They're more nocturnal, so they have much larger eyes, bigger ears, um, white feet, white belly. Um, they tend to be more arboreal too, meaning that they will climb trees and branches. So sometimes you'll actually see them running across a branch, oftentimes they'll have nests in sanding dead trees. Um, there's also meadow voles. Meadow voles are kind of, I call them the wild hamsters of the area. They're larger, they're more robust, their hair kind of sticks up in different directions. They have the short little tail like a hamster and they're very squeaky. They're always disgruntled and squeaking. Um, if you encounter them, you can see their trails in taller grass, especially on a a trail that's grassy on some place, like they have them on Bumpkin Island, they have some on Thompson Island, they have some on Grape Island. And you'll see these kind of little trails going across the grassy area. Sometimes you'll see one of them scuttling. You might even hear it squeaking if it's in that kind of mood. Um, that's also one of my favorites. And like I mentioned earlier, you can see gray squirrels on uh, Thompson Island, but they're not found on any of the others. And then of course, there's rats. Um, rats can swim the, the, the distance that rats can swim is actually shocking. Um, they can swim over a kilometer easily in open water. Um, there's some reports that they can swim up to, up to three miles in the ocean, which is very far. So you do see them on the islands. The only place where you, I've really seen populations that appear to be reproducing is Lovell's Island. And because of that, you do get some great horned owls on that island that specialize in predating on them. And in the winter, you do get some snowy owls too eating the rats. So it's, there's a silver lining to the rats as well, but they, they are found on, you know, just a few on islands every now and again when they, they kind of swim there. That's really interesting. I never even thought about seeing a rat swim <laughs> that far. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. No. It has been a joy talking to you and learning more about rodent communities. 
I know I'm very excited to explore my backyard and look for signs or squirrels or all different types of rodent communities um, in my neighborhood. And I'm sure that the viewers are excited to go back and explore as well. So it State was Park, wonderful. Thank you so much for this. From all of us at the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, we hope that you have learned something new. Uh, please share your discoveries with us using social media or using the iNaturalist app.